Well, President Trump put it all on the line in Alabama, and I mean he put it all on the line and he lost. He sided with the craziest, most unprofessional and hateful advisor in American politics, Steve Bannon, and the president locked himself in an embrace with an accused child molester in Alabama where the president of the United States was crushed, just crushed last night by the newest face of the resistance to out-of-control Trumpism. We have come so far, and the people of Alabama has, have spoken. They have said we... Republicans now know Donald Trump can find a way to lose elections for Republicans anywhere, anytime. Republicans now know that Donald Trump's support of Steve Bannon and Donald Trump's acceptance of advice from Steve Bannon is the very fast-acting cancer that can kill the Republican Party. You couldn't get the microphone out of Steve Bannon's hand when he was campaigning for Roy Moore and prancing around Alabama stages as if everyone was there just to see him and to listen to him. Steve Bannon knows nothing about Alabama politics, and he proved that every time he opened his mouth about Alabama politics. And last night, in the humiliating crush of defeat, here, here is what Steve Bannon had to say. Steve Bannon, who lied about Doug Jones every day of that campaign. Steve Bannon, who's always ready to attack Republicans like Mitch McConnell. Steve Bannon, who always tries to pretend to his small cult of followers that he's the toughest guy in the room. That Steve Bannon was slapped into a stunned silence last night by the voters of Alabama. This is the way Steve Bannon's adventure in Alabama will always now be remembered. This is a huge defeat for you. A stunned silence by the man who Alabama voters ignored or hated just as much as Washington Republicans hate him. Steve Bannon was immediately attacked by Mitch McConnell last night in a statement put out by McConnell's super PAC blaming Bannon for what happened in Alabama. Donald Trump's marching orders to Alabama were ignored just as much as Steve Bannon's. Get out and vote for Roy Moore. Do it, do it, do it. Do it, do it. They didn't do it. Here is the robocall that Donald Trump made to Republican voters in Alabama. Hi, this is President Donald Trump, and I need Alabama to go vote for Roy Moore. It is so important. We're already making America great again. I'm going to make America safer and stronger and better than ever before. But we need that seat. We need Roy voting for us. And it rambles on and on for another minute. And that robocall did Donald Trump and Roy Moore absolutely no good. That robocall just gave Donald Trump that much more ownership of the defeat in Alabama, where it is no longer clear that Donald Trump could win an election against the right Democrat in Alabama. Exit polls actually showed Donald Trump with only a 48 percent approval rating in Alabama and exactly the same disapproval rating. That's in a state that Donald Trump won by 28 points. It's because Donald Trump is collapsing. Trumpism is collapsing. A new Monmouth poll shows President Trump hitting a new low of 32 percent approval. After what was surely a short night's sleep, the president found a way to say, I told you so, this morning. When he tweeted, the reason I originally endorsed Luther Strange and his numbers went up mightily is that I said Roy Moore will not be able to win the general election. I was right, exclamation point. Roy worked hard, but the deck was stacked against him, another exclamation point. Today in Washington, we saw a post-election reaction unlike any we've ever seen before. Republicans overjoyed by the defeat of a Republican candidate for Senate. I thought it was a great night for America, so uh, I couldn't be more happy. I know that I'm supposed to only cheer for people on my side of the aisle, but uh, I thought the people of Alabama um, 
did a great thing for our country last night. I uh, hope it sends a message that, uh, you know, that we can do better, that Republicans can do better. What message did the election send last night? The Alabamas didn't want a, somebody who dated 14-year-old girls. Today in Alabama, Doug Jones took questions from reporters, and he said this. This campaign has given a lot of people uh, a reason to believe. They, they have a reason to hope uh, that they know that, that, you know, even though uh, things might be a long shot, it's possible. And they'll know, too, that you can create a lot of momentum. You can create things in a positive way uh, if you run the right campaign. Joining us now, John Heilman, National Affairs Analyst for NBC News and MSNBC, also with us near attendant, president of the Center for American Progress, and Jason Johnson, politics editor for TheRoot.com and an MSNBC contributor. And John Heilman, uh, Donald Trump took as much ownership of this thing as he possibly could have, uh, made that trip down to Florida, said right into the camera, right into the microphone, vote for him, do it, do it, did the robocall. And this morning, it's I told you so from Donald Trump. Yes, it is. And, you know, I, you looked at that and said, I was right. Um, I'm not sure what he meant when he said he was right, what he was right about in this instance. But, you know, uh, it, it's the craziest thing in the world is to hear Donald Trump somehow claiming some kind of moral victory when the obvious reality is that he suffered a gargantuan political loss. And I think it really does cut to the core, this, this loss. Uh, there are a million implications of this, Lawrence, which we can talk about. But the president of the United States, the, the, the fundamental political dynamic of the last year has been Republicans don't like Donald Trump in Washington, but they fear him. They fear his supporters. They fear his 85 percent approval rating among Republicans. They look at his falling uh, overall approval ratings and they say, well, it doesn't matter because within the party he's very popular. He still has coattails. He, he, we, you need him if you're going to win. And, and right now, after New Jersey and after Virginia, and particularly in Alabama, you look at it, you say, Donald Trump may just be a singular figure and that his numbers may have no correspondence whatsoever to the performance of Republican candidates anywhere. Because if Donald Trump can't win, even with all of Roy Moore's problems, if Donald Trump can somehow end up with a Democrat being elected to the Senate in Alabama, it might just be that Donald Trump has his own political strengths and weaknesses, but they have nothing to do with the success or failure of Republicans elsewhere in the country. And, uh, Nira, we, we're looking at the exit polls, the job approval for Donald Trump inside that. Uh, we see strongly approve 32 percent. Strongly disapprove is bigger at 41 percent. Uh, I think we can get that up on the screen. There we are. Uh, somewhat approve 15, somewhat disapprove 7. But to see there's m stronger disapproval than stronger approval for Donald Trump in Alabama, uh, how long are Republicans going to stay afraid of Donald Trump's so-called base? I think the reality is that Republicans who go along with Donald Trump are, you know, signing what could be a death wish. I mean, what you see every House Republican, every Senate Republican, these races are ones where he is engendering stronger and stronger opposition. Why they vote with him instead of trying to prove their independence when they see this in Alabama. Again, we saw this a similar thing in Virginia. New Jersey, you can explain that away, but Alabama is the heart of his support. As you remember, one of his first major rallies was in Alabama, thousands of people coming out. Those same people don't seem ready to support him. Jason, focus on the positive vote that was cast for Doug Jones last night, because this was not just uh, a lesser of two evils. Vote. Right, right. Um, this is what happens when Democrats realize that you actually put a candidate up there. It's not just <laughs> voting against the other guy. Imagine that. A real candidate. Um, you know, in, in an equal playing field, Doug Jones would actually have been a pretty good candidate. He has history in the state. He's he's an American hero. He, you know, he's, he's brought consequences in people who, who committed a racist terrorist act in the 1960s. So that was a very, very good move. I also think this. Look, the only person who I spoke to who saw Doug Jones winning uh, was a reporter at The Root, okay, a guy named yeah. Michael Harriet who lives in Birmingham, yeah. Alabama. Uh -huh. And Michael told me, he's like, look, if you look at what happened with Randall Woodfin, if you look at some of these black mayors in these small towns, people are ready for this change. So I think people were excited to actually see there's a chance to make a change here in a way that
that they didn't even see in 2008 and 2012. There's nothing like local knowledge, and yeah. someone who's actually from Birmingham looking at that would be able to tell us. Uh, John Heilman, the generic congressional ballot uh, now uh, shows Democrats at 51, Republicans at 36, and whenever the president uh, of, of a party drops below 50 percent, uh, that always uh, suggests a significant pickup uh, for the other party in Congress. This president is as far below 50 percent as anyone's ever been. Yeah, we don't have even really good historical models for this, Lawrence, because you, yeah. we have a lot of models that show what happens to the in-party in power when the president's below 50 at the end of his first year. Remember, this is the honeymoon year, right? This is the year when the yeah. president's supposed to <laughs> this have was done supposed big to be things easy. and be at the yeah. height of his popularity. <laughs> Right. So we're not supposed to look up. We don't literally we do not have a, a models antecedents where you can look and say what happens when a president is not just below 50, but below 40. And in fact, not just below 40, but closer to 30 than 40. There's no model for that. And then you add the generic ballot, as you just pointed in the numbers, Donald Trump's approval rating. The performance that he's had in these off-year elections and the generic ballot is probably the most terrifying collection of data that any party has had in modern history going into a midterm election. You were looking into the abyss. Uh, let's listen to the senator who stood up uh, to Donald Trump, stood up to Steve Bannon, Republican Senator Richard Shelby, and said he was not going to vote for the Republican in this election. Let's listen to what he had to say today. The people of Alabama spoke, uh, talked to Doug Jones uh, oh, 30, 40 minutes ago, congratulated him. I've known him a long time, and I told him that I uh, look forward to working with him up here for great interest of the nation and the people of Alabama. I think basically the, the voters, over, or the majority of the voters in my state chose principle over politics. Neera, here's how long Richard Shelby has known Doug Jones. Uh, they were both Democrats back when. Yeah, uh, no, I back, remember back, that. <laughs> back, back when Doug Jones was a staffer uh, for the other Republican, uh, Senator Howell Heflin, uh, in the Senate. Yeah, he goes back a long time. And I'd say, look, uh, a, a big coalition came out. A lot of people came out against Roy Moore. And the fact is that. Uh, Donald Trump wasn't able to pull them back. And his agenda, he, he argued that Doug Jones would be a liberal, he would vote against his, his agenda, he'd vote against tax cuts, and it didn't matter. He was still, Doug Jones was still able to assemble a coalition, a coalition that was really driven by African American women. There was a huge gender gap. 97% uh, of African American women voted for Doug Jones, and you know, close to that of African American men. But you also saw more white crossover than we've seen in previous elections. Right. What Republicans try to do is make that a choice between whites and blacks in, in Alabama. And what is hopeful about this is that Doug Jones was able to bring a coalition together that was majority people of color, but also millennials, uh, more college-educated whites uh, than Democrats have in the past, and I think that's a really hopeful sign for the future. And Jason, Doug Jones now has three years of incumbency to let Alabama see that if you just go back to as recently as 1993, right. when uh, <laughs> when both of the Alabama senators were Democrats, the state won't blow up, right. no yeah. disaster's gonna happen, exactly. you know, <laughs> Richard Shelby's gonna be there, Doug Jones is gonna be there, and w he sounds like the kind of Southern Southern senator, senator, Southern Democratic senator, who could actually win re-election. Well, yeah, the, the kind of Southern Democratic senator used to exist. Yeah, uh, yes. just like we used to have, you know, Republicans <laughs> up north. Um, but I think one of the best things that Doug Jones said when he's been talking, you know, since being elected, is I hope this turns this uh, Alabama into a two-party state. Yeah. yeah, because that benefits all the voters if there's actual competition. And one other thing that I think is so key about this: Donald Trump's special form of magic, the special set of skills that he seems to be able to have, they only work for him. It, it's very. <laughs> yeah clear that other people can't run this. Other people can't run and say offensive things and racist things and anti-Semitic things. It, it caught me. Steve Bannon insulted Mitt Romney for going on his Mormon mission trip, yeah. and he yeah. claimed that that was him skipping out on Vietnam. There's 37,000 Mormons in Alabama. You think they heard that? Yeah. So it's about time the Republicans learn they've got to run a different way, too, if they want to be successful. And uh, let's listen to what Doug Jones had to say today about the phone calls he received. Some of them are pretty surprising. I have received calls from so many uh, well-wishers of friends and family, but also um, future colleagues in Washington on both sides of the aisle. I have received calls from 
uh, Democratic senators. I've received calls from my longtime friend, uh, Senator Shelby, uh, Leader McConnell, Leader Schumer, uh, and, and calls from the uh, President of the United States, President Trump. This election shows that people across this country, I mean, uh, want to see people work together. Nira, I would expect uh, Mitch McConnell to call. Uh, it makes sense. He believes that a, a Democrat in Alabama can maybe come his way on some votes. Mm -hmm. Of course, Richard Shelby's going to call. That's what senators do. Uh, the president of the United States, Donald Trump, called the Democrat who won a Senate seat. Did someone say to him, you've got to start lobbying him, that you've got to start, start lobbying Jones now? You might be able to get his vote on something? I don't know. I mean, today, these morning tweets seem to have forgotten all the tweets he had before attacking Doug Jones. So maybe he made the call, forgetting all the things he called him on Friday night and mm -hmm. Saturday morning and Sunday and mm -hmm. Monday and Tuesday. Um, I think that uh, people want to talk about uh, issues, etc. But what happened here is Doug Jones repudiated Trumpism. Yes. He said, you know what? Alabama can rise above splitting one group against another group. That was the core of his message from the day he won the primary through the summer till today. And I think Republicans should recognize that there is a majority forming in the country, many of whom used to be Republicans, who are now voting for Democrats because they're so disgusted by, I hate to, you know, I hate to use the term, but gutter politics. Mm -hmm. Neera Tandon and Jason Johnson, thank you both for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Coming up, African-American women made the difference in